Look within. Look within. Look within. And live your life. And live your life on the edge of two worlds. A reality where you find true understanding of who you are. Take the step into the unknown with Alexander McCaig and Jason Rigby as they explore the thinly veiled world of consciousness, spirit, and the human condition. Join them in embodying the oneness of all. Walk the cliff's edge between the seen and the unseen realities. Welcome to High Density Living. And today, Alex, we have a guest. We got a real, we got a great guest. You know why he's great? Because what? he's Jerry, and he's in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and he has a he has a uh, motorcycle name. His last name. It's kind of like a motor. It's like Kawasaki. Like, oh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. But that's, that's great. What is okay. it like, Jerry Aprilia, Jerry Ducati, Jerry? What Jerry is it? Nowaki. Nowaki. Yeah. Like Kawasaki. Kawasaki. Nowaki. No, I like that. <laughs> what part of uh, where are you originally from? Uh, Buffalo, Buffalo, New York. So you're New. York. So I got, I got two East Coast in one fools room. here. Yeah, that's why I asked him. He came in here looking like he just stepped off of Greenwich, Connecticut. He's got like Ra- Polo, Ralph Lauren on. Yeah, he looks like he's from your neck of the woods. Yeah, but now I feel like trash. <laughs> now I remember why I left that area because I looked bad compared to everybody else. <laughs> you got the gangster vegan shirt on. Yeah, I do. So yeah, you're only, go- you're only here in New Mexico though. <laughs> that's awesome. So Jerry, we have. Uh, I like having guests. I think this is fun. We had one last week, and now we have a one this week. But you're live in the studio, so appreciate you yes. being here today. We have an amazing story, and I want people... Alex, before we have Jerry tell the story, I, I want you to kind of, if you don't mind, um, let's talk about ghosts and, uh, you know, wh- wh- like people, there's beliefs. Like You know, you know people, I don't like that word. <laughs> I know you don't. What, what do you call it? What belief? No, 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 not belief, but like like a ghost. Yes. Okay, so you're you're talking about a, a, something that's disembodied from the material, mm-hmm. right? So when I when someone talks about a ghost, or like in German, you have a Geist, you know, or any sort of you know uh, cultural background that you might come from. Everybody has a concept of something, or in terms of like an afterlife, unless you're totally delusional from you know what the really re- the reality is, because there's a transition stage that people need to go through. So once they've left this material realm, okay, they've garnered their experiences here, there's time when the spirit needs to actually rest and integrate the learnings that's taken over its life. And so what I understand from a spiritual aspect is that the ghost is really the embodiment of that spirit in a spherical form, right? In an energetic form, but still residing here in a dimension that almost sits but up right against this material one that we're in. So when I when I'm when I think people are like, oh, you know, I can communicate with it, I can take a picture of it. Well, that that actually does make a lot more sense that way. You know, it helps, you know, validate that sort of experience that a lot of people have. Because if I'm collecting these photos, photography, you know, audible stuff, like I might be recording it with like what you know ghost hunters have with like EVPs and things like right. that. You know that oh wait a minute something is here right because we know for a fact through the analysis that something outside of what is clearly happening in the material realm is still coming in. So there's some other frequency, electromagnetic, that's actually occurring, right? The spiritual density that is peaking in to what our dimension is right here. And so that's my understanding of what a ghost is. And so when it, it, and Jerry, I don't know what you're going to talk about today, <laughs> but if he's teeing me up, I'm, I'm going to have to make an assumption without making an ass at anybody here or myself that you are going to talk about your experience with that part of the spiritual realm and whether it's a function of belief for you. Okay. And I'll, I can explain if you want later why I don't think belief is a good way to term things, but um, your experience with the spiritual realm or ghosts or angels or whatever you want to dictate or call it or extrapolate it into something, you know, that has actually affected your life. And, and that's just my assumption. Is that what we're going to talk about? Yeah. Yes. All right, cool deal. And there was a Jerry. We'll start from the very beginning, and and I want I want you to tell the story to our audience. You know, it's audio, so they're listening. Right. If you could like start from the very beginning, so you met this girl. Yeah, I was in uh, I was in high school at the time, uh, many years ago, and I was that at was eighteen ninety two guys. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Really Were you still? That. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think the Model T was out yet. 
Alex, I thought you were. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, Jerry. <laughs> you just bus rolled me. <laughs> it's okay. Jerry, I don't no think they had buses in. back then. Yeah, there yeah. we go. You got them. Oh, okay, man. go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Jerry. <laughs> so anyway, I was, uh, I was at a friend's house, and uh, my friend Jim, and I just happened to look across the street, and this diagonally across the street, maybe 75 feet, I don't know, not that far, this beautiful girl goes up the stairs into this house. And I said, Jim, who's that? And he says, that's so-and-so. And And I said, oh, my God, she's beautiful. And so anyway, that started the the fixation with wanting to meet this girl, Debbie. And so I uh, kind of... Kind of snuck in the back door. Her mother used to sit on the porch all the time with her her younger brother. And so, anyway, make a long story short. Well, don't make it too short. I you glossed over the fixation. <laughs> I want to well, actually know what you felt and what was the draw. You didn't even explain it because you know people want to know. Help them feel this. Well, I mean, this is great, Alex, and that's why the questions have to come in. There was some. It's giving me. Oh, jeez. It's. It was some kind of a. Almost familiarity in a way. Now we're talking, Jerry. Yeah, it was almost like a. See, at that time, I didn't think it was a familiarity, but in hindsight, after I got a little bit more aware, I said, "Oh my God, that was like, that was like, you know, you just you knew her, or there was some kind of connection." That's what, let me just say it that way. So there was this connection, and I was pretty persistent in getting to know her. And her younger brother, Michael, <clears throat> they lived upstairs. And this was more like in the the the, the, the summer, and so uh, Michael used to because I got along with the her you know her, her baby brother because I was funny and you know kind of you know animated and he liked that so he used to ask <laughs> Jerry can, you funny come on <laughs> he, he used to ask can 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 Jerry come up and play with me and so eventually her mother said okay that opened the door Debbie would come around. She didn't really like me, but she wasn't turned off by me initially. And then the relationship started to develop from that because I was allowed other privileges to come over. And she actually had two brothers and a sister and come out and hang with them and have some fun and, you know, make them laugh and all these things. So that's how it started. And then uh, somewhere along the way, I can't remember because the timeline is a hundred years ago now, like as you said. <laughs> and so, Jerry, how do you live so long? Tell yeah. us the secret. Uh, I'm working on it. So anyway, um, we just kind of my persistence, kind of. I hate to use the word wore her down, but I'm using that terminology <laughs> because that was kind of the way it was. And I remember the first time I kissed her. And it all started, it all, you know, really took off from there. And we, you know, bonded. We were first-time lovers together. And um, What do you mean by first-time lovers? In first a time physical sense? Physical sense, yes. Thank you. Yeah, clarity helps, right? Yes, yes. And yes. don't be, listen, don't be shy. We're okay. not judging on any way, shape, or form. Okay. Even though no. we're going to give you a little shit, it's okay, we're not going to judge you. It's okay. And so we were first-time lovers, physical lovers, and um, it all matured from there. And she just... You know, we make those young vows where we're going to be together forever. And unfortunately, I got kind of, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, I went through a metamorphosis and I really got kind of, I'll use it for that time in the, in, in 68, <laughs> hundred years ago, as I said, uh, I really got kind of cool. I trimmed, I wasn't fat or anything, but I really trimmed down. I got all the clothes. I got the haircut. I got everything going. And all of a sudden, kind of the moth turned into the butterfly. I knew you were a moth. Yeah, a moth, caterpillar. Caterpillar. Yeah, caterpillar. Moths, moths stay moths. I'm sorry. Right? Caterpillar, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Jerry's his own type of evolution. <laughs> yeah, the, the caterpillar turns kind of into the butterfly. And then um, I took a, a liking to motorcycles. And I got my first bike. It was a back in the day. It's a vintage. It's a special vintage bike now called the Honda 160 Scrambler. Uh, and then from there, 
got a Harley, and I was working for her father in the blacktop uh, business. Her father's a great guy. Deb's Super, father? Debbie's father was okay. a great guy. Her uncles, they were all, I was all part of this family. So I had no brothers or sisters, so it really felt good. It really, really felt good. And they were funny. And so when we were on the job site, it was a lot of ball busting and mm. just a lot of fun. And what You know, we worked, we got the job done, but there was a lot of humor in between. And, you know, there were restaurants we couldn't go in because we... We got a little rowdy in there at lunchtime and things like that. Not crazy rowdy, but just enough where we piss people off. <laughs> and so, and so anyway, cousin Raymond used to go in the in the men's toilet and rip the toilet right out. Wait, <laughs> he ripped the toilet right out. Like he sent it out of the stall when he was done, or he just yeah. go in there and just yank it out of there. Sometimes, or he ripped the sink off the wall. He was really like so, a weed right out of the ground. Yeah, just rip it right out. He was he was crazy. And so anyway, he's got a thing for porcelain. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's not you know, the right color palette, Jerry. We got to get rid of this thing. <laughs> and so a couple, of, a couple of years goes by. I'm getting a little bit more cool, and I end up meeting this other girl. Now remember, Debbie's a lot younger. She is. Uh, I was, I was about sixteen at the time, fifteen ish, around fifteen when I met her. She was thirteen, not that much younger, but she was younger, and. Um, then, like I say, this this maturing process started to come on with the clothes and the, you know, the stylish clothes. You're getting cool, yeah. It's getting very cool for the time. And do you, I got to so that was def, you in your mind that defined your maturity? I'm sorry, say that again? That defined your maturity? Well, it was part of fitting in at the time. Okay, that makes more sense. Being so, like a motorcycle guy, that was kind of like you were trying to be like that, well, like Harley was, guy? I, well, no, not the Harley guy. It was more... Um, like a city guy, like a well, yeah, you know, I had these these fringe jackets that were made by the same clothier in San Francisco that made all the clothes for Jefferson Airplane, Jimi Hendrix, oh, and cool all of deal. them. And you know, I knew somebody else that you know put that kind of arrangement together for me, and they got me these these jackets, and they were just really amazing, uh, you know, suede and leather combinations, and just really very very cool stuff for the time. So anyway, you know, I get real cool. I, I go through a couple of different uh, uh, motorcycles, but along the way I meet this other gal. Her name was Anne. And Debbie's a beautiful woman, but Anne was like this exotic, I'll use the word Nefertiti. Oh, wow. Egyptian type, black raven hair. When she would wear these jumpsuits, it looked like somebody poured her into them. I mean, just absolutely perfect. That's why that. Yeah, why that's why did you use the word Egyptian? Yeah. Well, because she looked, she had that very sculpture. Was she like an old soul? Actually, Jason, that is a great question because she was into astrology and all this stuff. Mm. And so, yes, she talked about stuff that was so far at that time above my pay grade. Was this, I'm glad you said that. Now, were you, did you have a taste of sort of that sort of nomenclature that she was using to talk about life and existence? Well, she would but, explain things. But is it the first time, is this like, because you're hanging out with a bunch of, you know, biker dudes that love getting rowdy, you're a cool dude, and now someone's like, oh, let's talk about the fine fluidal realm, you know, let's talk about astrology. Well, she she introduced me to it. Thanks, that's what I want to know. Yeah, she introduced me to it. I wasn't really aware of it. I thought it was a little bit, you know, out there, but- my uh, my inquisitiveness has was back there back then, even way younger, and it still exists today. You know, a, a long, long time later, and so uh, there was this this conflict going on. It was a it was, and you'll see where this goes in a second. It was this relationship that was. She could, this woman, I, and every guy that was anybody in town was chasing her. And I mean that. She doctors, was powerful. She was, yes. Doctors were chasing seduction. her. Oh, there was a draw to this woman. She had, yeah. she had an old age seduction about yes. her. I believe yeah. women have that. And oh, she, yeah. I've seen that before. That, that's, yeah. that's mucho power. You know, the, um, a pertinent it, example of that, Korea. Mm. You'll find these groups where the woman is in the front and all of the friends hang behind her. But mm-hmm. you know, she's like the matriarch and it's guys, girls, doesn't matter who it is. And everywhere they walk, 
she's the draw in the front. It's almost like she's the lead goose. You know what I mean? And everyone's like, oh, I got to I get into it's the It's like formation. Cleopatra. I mean, yeah. look, look at that power she this had where she brought she down. Like. She, she was like that. She could just bring down men. Unbelievable. And, uh, and so I we used to, you know, after we would go out on Friday nights, I was with my friends. There were several different restaurants we'd go to for breakfast at one or two in the morning. And she would come in with her, a couple of her friends who were also very stunningly beautiful, contrastingly, but very beautiful. So I just be happened to be sitting at the booth, with my friends, Art and a few other guys, and she'd be sitting over there and I'd just be staring at her. And, and, uh, it just, it all kind of, it just was, <laughs> I still don't understand it all these years later. Cause she could have had anybody and, you know, guys with a lot of money and, you know, better looking guys and all this kind of, you know, all this kind of surface stuff, but there was something else there. And so we connected and we went out, we started going out, and I was going out with Debbie at the same time and lying to her. I don't, I'm just going to say it the way it was. Sure, you jerk. Yeah, I was lying <laughs> Figure to her. Figure it out. So you were like 17 at this time? or 16? Uh, Yeah, and, and actually at that time I was 17 because mm. this gal, Anne, was older than I was. She That's was what people do in high school, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting, her astrology, she was the perfect Leo, mm. just the perfect Leo. And what I mean by that is she was the lioness. And I'm telling you, again, I, I know I'm ex trying to explain this, but that's who she was. And she commanded that kind of a, attention when she walked in a place. And so we start going out. I'm lying to Debbie about this and that, but I'm still seeing her. You know, we're still, and there was always this familiarity. After I got to, you know, after we connected, there was this familiarity. And so... As time goes on, Debbie knew something was going on. Debbie and my mother were extremely close. They would sew together. They would go shopping together. And Debbie was realistically, the way I always said it, was the daughter my mother never had. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and her family was the family you never had. And her family, was, exactly. Because <clears throat> my mother was from the old country, from Poland. And... Um, Let's just say expressing love was not at the top of the list. And it's okay. I love my mother. And we've had connections that I'll talk about. I'll weave that in here. And it was the same with my father. They had been divorced a lot of years. And my, my father left me alone a lot when I would go visit him as I was growing up. So I was pretty much on my own. And Debbie's family filled in the gap, a lot of the gaps, because of her brothers and mm. sister and all this kind of stuff. So anyway... Debbie is, you know, sensing that this is going on. Now I'm going to just fast forward a little bit. And one evening we're working out in a suburb of Buffalo called West Seneca. And I said, Al, I, I got a date with Ann at like at seven o'clock. And so I said to Debbie's father, uh, Al, can I get off just a little early tonight? You know, I never asked for uh, Jerry. Yes, of course, you know, just do what you got to do. So, because out in West Seneca from where I lived was about a half hour you know, ride and I needed to get home, clean up and do this. And I was going to meet Ann down at this park where we all gathered in front of the Buffalo Art Museum overlooking Delaware Lake. It's a very beautiful area, one of the nicer areas in Buffalo. So I go home, I get out, you know, I get changed. I jump on my, on my Harley, my Sportster, and I go over to Debbie's house. And uh, she, we're outside talking. And uh, she goes, aren't you going to come in? I said, no, it's a beautiful night. This is August 6, 1971. I said, it's a beautiful night. I'm going to go for, I'm going to go for a little ride. Was that a lie? Absolutely. And so um, she says, I know where you're going. I said, what are you talking about? You're going to go with her, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not doing that. She goes, yes, you are. I can tell. <laughs> exact words. These are exact <laughs> words. And so... Uh, she goes, I want to go for a ride. He says, Deb, your father is not home yet, and he doesn't want you on that bike. Your mother doesn't want you on that bike. The answer is no. She goes, I'm going to go talk to my mother. So she goes upstairs, talks to her mother. Her mother says, fine. I said, oh, shit. I said, okay, all right. So we jump. she jumps on the bike, 
And I could walk you through the route, but let me say it this way. I never went to the park to meet Anne, okay? Yeah, that seems clear now. Okay. Showing up with another girl on the back of the bike and be like, I don't think so. So I'm coming up to this this city street, um, and it 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 tees into um, one of the main uh, neighborhood um, air streets called Elmwood Avenue, where there's a lot of bars. It's a walking neighborhood, you know. It's a walking street, and everybody who was anybody, you know, you'll go to Jimmy Max, you'll go to the No Name, you'll go. There's several other bars. You go to um, um, I forgot the one down the street, um, but there's several bars, you know? And so I make the right onto Elmwood Avenue. I'm stopped at the traffic light and guess who comes running by in her red Volkswagen? And she goes right by mm. and she's, you know, she doesn't look, I don't, you know, she was that kind of, she was, maybe she was observant in her own way, but she wasn't, she didn't pay attention to a lot of stuff. Drive, I'm literally the first one at the light. The light's right there, and she's 25 feet away, 50 feet, whatever. And she goes by, and so we go up to the next corner, make a left, go down to this other major street called Delaware. I stop in the gas station, get some gas, and we ride down Delaware. Going through these Delaware turns, I go down about a mile, turn around in this in this parking lot, and just start heading up nice and slowly up Delaware, back through the same way we just came. And I'm thinking to myself, well, instead of going down Forest Avenue, which is really busy, I'll just go down Bird. And I live on Bird. So you used to be able to make a right from Elmwood down to Bird. And there was um, there were other traffic, uh, there were other traffic lights there. And there's this, as you come down Bird, there's this traffic circle, a roundy round, call it what you want, and several parking, several parkway roads, Chapin Parkway and Bidwell Parkway kind of kind of come into this roundy round and you can go down Bird or you can continue straight, which will take you down to the park at Delaware Avenue. So I'm coming up to the light and I give it a little gas. And when I say a little gas, maybe I went from 25 to 30, but it, between 20, I never rode that this bike fast. It was not the kind of bike you would ride fast. So anyway, next thing I remember, I'm, uh, I'm on the, one of the medians and I wake up and I could hear her coughing. And so the guy ran the red light and I T-boned him, but mm. I don't remember that. So you T-boned him. Yeah, but he ran the red light. Okay, so there's an accident. There was an accident. I T-boned him. He kept going, was hit and run. And I hear her coughing, and I'm crawling on my hands and knees. And I'm saying, Deb, Deb, you know? And this guy comes up to me, goes, put this on your arm. And this arm was gashed open pretty big, and my foot was broke. And so um, he uh, he says, put this on your arm and just 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 relax. He says, we're working on her. And like I say, I could hear her coughing. How long were you out for? Probably just a minute or two. Who's working on her? Some g- people that stopped. Oh, okay. I, I'm like, is there an EMT that was just standing no. on the corner watching Well, this? I don't know who they were, but there were people working on her, okay? Okay. And so I could hear the ambulance coming. I could hear coming. And the interesting part of it is up this other end, there's the roads going here, then up the other end of the parkway is the hospital called Fillard, Millard Fillmore Hospital. You could see it. Mm. You could see it. So they load us into the into this cube cube van ambulance and she's on the gurney and I'm sitting in the jump seat and I'm looking at her and she's gray. She's gray. She's gone. And so we get to the hospital, which is like I say, three minutes away. The whole ER scene starts. My mother comes in, her mother and father come in and, but she's gone. They couldn't save her. My mother's tore up. My mother, my mother is like rock hard. So, uh, I don't want to like get like, this this is too. Okay. When you saw her there, Gray, were you in too much of a state of shock to really process anything? I, yeah. I'd li- actually like to know how you felt because the moment you saw this woman back when you were 15, 13, maybe younger, you had an immediate draw, an immediate connection to her. Did you feel like that connection left when you were there with her in the ambulance? 
I honestly can't answer that. That's a hard thing to answer right now. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't want to press too okay. much. No, no, yeah. no. You can press anything you want because I've, you know, I've lived this a million times. And uh, and so, you know, they get done doing all they could do. And, you know, back at that time, they didn't have enough. But what happened is, you know how the windshield of a car wraps around and you've got the, the post that, that the windshield mounts to, well, she hit right in that, that area there. I'm guessing her chest or something. Well, no, it was her head. The helmet oh, okay. came off. You know, your body contorts like this. People get knocked out of their shoes and yeah. all kinds of stuff. So the, she hit there and I think she did have some internal injuries, but when you saw her, you, you couldn't tell by looking at her that, you know, she wasn't all banged up. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, um, uh, so after the, you know, after this whole, after let's just say an hour, they put a cast on my leg, they stitch up my arm, and my mother grabs me by the hand. She goes, come and look at her. And so they have her in this room off to the side, and my mother pulls the sheet. And I was in such shock that I remember going in the room. I remember it was all lit up, but I don't remember seeing her hmm. laying there uh, like that. And so... You know, a lot of stuff s- starts from there just as much as other stuff ends. And so, ironically, Ann's brothers, Tony and Ronnie, tracked me down. I was sitting after this whole thing was done. It's about, let's just say, 12 o'clock at night that or 12 in the morning, however you want to say it. I don't remember the exact time period. But they pull up in front of Ann's house. And they said, are you okay? And I said, well... Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, they see the, you know, they're, you know, bandaged up. And they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. They, I don't know. They said, why don't you come with us? So that's Ann's brothers. So I end up staying at Ann's house for a few days. That was even uglier. But I was just so, I'm not making excuses. I just, I'm accountable, man. I'm accountable for everything. You're 100% responsible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it gets it gets intense over there with her, me and her not in, in a love making way okay and i'm all banged up and so uh all this is conflicting inside me so i said i listen i got to go to the to the funeral home and i got to pay a visit so i go in there at the amagon funeral home and i walk you know i'm in a cast i'm in a crutch on the crutches and so i walk in there and there's a lot of her friends from school. She had just graduated that year. And uh, just a couple of months before, this is August, so she graduated. At, it was, I can't remember exactly May or June, but you know, just 90 days. Mm-hmm. And you could, uh, a pin or a feather dropping to the floor would have been like a grenade going off when I walked in there. It was ugly, man. And so she's, they have an open casket. She's in this yellow dress, and I do remember this, and she looked very normal. And I didn't know what to say. And uh, you know, so I, you know, I'm in there for a few minutes, and I walk out, and I go up to the corner, and all of a sudden I hear her sister Linda saying, Jerry, Jerry, wait a minute. So we go down the street a little little bit. We start talking. I don't remember exactly what we spoke about, but we, we, you know, spoke a little bit. And I think she said, you know, you weren't to blame. And, you know, my, you know, my mom and dad, you know, everything was going to, you know, everything will be fine. They'll be fine. You'll be welcome around. And I think that was said, I, I'm kind of ad-libbing right now, but it was all okay. And then Ann pulls up in a red Volkswagen because she did drop me off there. And so we go back to her house, and I stayed there for about a week. And uh, it just was a big, you know. So her parents were cool with you? Yeah, I went back to work for her father. It took a little time, you know. Right. It took a little time, but I went back to work, and her her father, her uncles, and her cousins, you know, uh, uh, who all worked in that, you know, in this in this family blacktop company were all – it was just like nothing ever happened. I, you know, I speak to her uncle Tony. I call him up every once in a while. He's eighty four now, and he remembers me. And he remember he, he's got a crystal clear memory. And so we still talk. Her father died of brain cancer in the mid eighties, 
and uh, her other un- her, her father brother her father's brother uncle Augie, he died in the nineties. I can't remember from what, but all those guys are gone, and so I stayed very close with her brother Bush. Her sister Linda and uh, her sister Linda ended up moving to Texas with this this guy, and her younger brother Michael, who unfortunately is in jail right now, is going to get out in September. Uh, you know, he was growing up, but Butch, I, I got into drag racing and I took Butch with me everywhere. We went to hockey games, Buffalo Sabre hockey games. He, you know, we, he was part of my racing crew and we were very, very tight. And this is going on in the eighties now. And then, um, in, in, in the nineties, uh, I started getting my own ideas about moving and doing other things. And I always had a dream to do a cross country motorcycle trip. So I meet this girl, Lynn, Lynn, and um, I meet her at this restaurant, and we connect. Beautiful gal. And she had this adventurous spirit, and uh, we started going out. And so we were up in Saratoga Springs. I was doing, uh, I was in the direct mail business at that time, and I was calling on banks up there, small banks. So we did very well with small banks. And so anyway, uh, that day, I, I, she goes, what are we going to do today? This was in the morning. And I said, well, maybe we'll go look at those, at the Harley, we'll find the local Harley dealer and we'll just go over there and take a look. And so later that afternoon, it's snowing out. We're having a couple of drinks at this really nice, excuse me, rest, restaurant bar. And so it's about two o'clock and it's snowing pretty well and pretty good out. And she says to me, aren't we going to go look at those Harleys? And I said, Lynn, you know, I looked at my watch and I said, they're probably close. She goes, come on, let's go. So we jump in the car and go. We go to McDermott's Harley Davidson. He's got like 10 bikes in the place. Nine of them are sold. And the only bike that's not sold is this black custom soft tail, which is exactly what I wanted. Was that the one that Schwarzenegger had? No, uh, Arnold had a, a fat boy. Oh, he had the fat but they're boy. they're similar. They're yeah. similar. Except it's got the 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 soft tail has a skinnier front tire. It's more of a chopper look. Okay. Yeah, more of a chopper look. And so we ended up, you know, I ended up buying the bike that day, and one thing led to another, and then that summer I did my first cross country motorcycle trip with Lynn. We 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 didn't do it from California, but we did it from Arizona. We whitewater rafted through the Grand Canyon. We just had this real adventurous time. It was really, really great. And um, I got a little sidetracked because for some reason, again, the voice comes in and says, you need to call him. Uh, uh, what, this guy was doing a lot of uh, maintenance work for me, Mike, uh, Mike Barry. What are you talking about? Hold on a second. Yeah. There's a totally new thing you put in the story here. What do you mean by a voice came in? Well, I've had this this um, connection with some strange unseen, I'll call it an entity that has kind of made, helped me direct my life at different times in, in certain situations. Okay. And it still exists today. And so anyway, you know, we, I call Mike Barry. We're in Colorado now. We left Arizona, did all this stuff. We stopped in Sedona, fell in love with Sedona. A lot of great things happened. So I called, goes, Jerry, you got a couple of busted pipes over on Kenmore. He goes, I'm going to take care of it. But he goes, there's some water damage. This and, that. and it just threw me off. It just threw the rest of the trip off. So we just kind of hustled back to New York. And so anyway, make a longer story short. I want to keep the, the context of what, what this is really all about, because that's the most powerful part, is that I went through a lot of transitions. I ended up moving to Arizona, moving to, to Portland, Oregon. I had a sales training company after I sold my direct mail business. And... There were times Debbie's the thoughts of Debbie would come in, but not, you know, I just thought it was an, in a sense, even though I thought about her a lot, I just thought it was an experience of life that I just had to, you know, live with. Right. And so. I keep that up by you. Sorry about that. I didn't get to eat the microphone. No, no, it's, it's good. And so, you know, I had a lot of adventures in, in, you know, Oregon, Arizona and all this stuff. And I used to go, when I was in Sedona, one evening I went up to the Chapel of the Red Rocks, which is a uh, 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 
Frank Lloyd Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd did, Wright. He had design. It's an arch chapel, kind of built into the rocks. It's a small. Cube. It's classic him building a thing right into nature. Yeah. 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 Just a beautiful, beautiful chapel. So one night when I was living in Sedona, I went up there. It actually was an August sixth evening, and at that time you could go. You know, they they had no gates or anything going on there, and so I used to go up there. It was pitch black. You could just see silhouettes of the mountains, the the rim. And uh, uh, Courthouse Butte that was just out there. Sorry, I don't mean guys. I don't mean to be a pain. This no. is the only issue with podcasting, yeah. right? Is like, no, 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 I'm, sorry. I'm getting a little animated here. Yeah. And so I'm standing there about 10 feet out from the door of the chapel. Remember, it's closed. It's black. It's dark. You could barely see your hand, literally barely see your hand in front of your face. And I'm talking to the, to myself or to her. I'm saying, you know, Deb, uh, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but, you know, I miss you. I love you. And it's just, you know, I just wish you were here and so on and so forth. So I'm standing uh, kind of in front of the door, like I say, about 10 feet out. And as I'm saying that, I kind of turn around to face the, the Mogollon Rim, which is, you know, just right there. Sure. And all of a sudden I turn around and this giant... I don't mean like thumb size. I'm talking like the size of one of these apartment building complex buildings. This giant meteor looking thing is right there churning through the sky. And I'm telling you, it's as big as big can be. And it's throwing all these sparks off. And I just said, Oh my God, is that you? And so, you know, that started some of this door opening experiences that I had, and that was in ninety, like ninety five. That was in nineteen ninety five. So let me let me understand this. Yeah, you went and you saw this Frank Lloyd Wright Chapel. Yes. And in the middle of the evening, yes, you had an intention when you happened yes. to be there that this would be some sort of catalyst for you. I don't know what it did, but it was a catalyst. Yeah. That. Had you call out? No, did you say this audibly or did you say this in your I said mind? it audibly. You said something audibly. And did you mean it? Yeah, 100%. Okay, so this is interesting. And then after you had made this comment, yeah. right, this pledge, whatever it might be, whatever you want to call it, to, to Debbie, you turned around and something in the sky occurs. And this, whatever it might have been, meteor, whatever, I don't know if it impacted, then it's a meteor, right? But almost reaffirmed what you had just said. And so this physical thing you're staring at yes. for you confirmed that, Oh, okay. The possibility now of communicating with her is, it, you know, you, do you see what I'm getting at? Yes. Is the moment you turned around, did that put a trigger in your mind to be like, wait a minute, this actually is possible because from what I'm being told, the, the other voice that's been guiding you your entire life has been coming in and out. So now you're just taking what I would say is the natural next step. So let me take a step from this voice and then see if I can actually speak out to it. It's the, then, yeah. Because, uh, cause what I'm really curious is that there's like, seems like there's two voices. Yeah. There's it, the, uh, there's the one that has guided you through your life and you don't know what that is. Well, I, I, I honestly didn't at the time. I, I felt it was benevolent it had not ever given me any real, let's just say, uh, wrong information. I just use that. And can we be clear here, right? Because yeah. there's, you know, people, you go to psychics and like, oh, I hear the person coming through or, you know, I see the image. Can you describe what it's like to hear a voice? Is the voice match your voice? As if I was going to read a book and I'm hearing the sentence in my own mind, is it in my tone, is it in my speech? Does it carry the same syntax and grammar that you use? Could I really would like to know what it's like to hear that sort of voice come through? And I, there are a lot of people out there that want to know because most people are like I hear a voice. Well, what about it? What does it sound like? Male, female, androgynous? I don't know. It, it, it is a male voice, and uh, I don't really. Let me, you ask a great question about uh, the, like the tone. Yeah. I don't think it's, it could be 
a similar tone to mine, but I honestly cannot say that it would match my tone. All I know is it kind of comes in. And when you say come in, I, I really want you to be explicit because yeah, come people in. want to know what that means because it's so generic. A voice comes in. What What is the coming in? Is it heard through the ears or is it heard like a thought? It's heard. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. It's, it's I'm not hurting. trying to be a pain. It's just it's extremely important that everyone can understand. No, I want to context. explain it because you're asking me great questions that I haven't given a lot of consideration to, and now is the opportunity to do that. You're on higher density living now. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, we're going to deep dive it. And so the, the – I, I hear it in my head. Okay. I hear it in my head. Like a thought? Or it's much louder than a thought. That's, this is what I want to know, right? Yeah, it's so much louder than a thought. It's difficult for me if someone's like screaming in your head. Well, I'm like when I think about that, I'm like, well, how do I scream in my head? It's like all thoughts are at the same, you know, like level. Yes. So when you say it's that much louder, to me, then that would say that it has an energetic backing to it that's Absolutely. actually much stronger mm, than what yes. your thoughts are actually pushing out. So I want to know. What you mean by like it's that like it's that it's greater in its resonance or whatever it might be? Yeah, and it, it it's not a you know it doesn't give me a uh, it's not giving me a, um, a you know any kind of a a long dissertation on what to do. It 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 just kind of gives me this short reaffirming type of guidance in certain areas or certain decisions. And again, I want me to be really clear here: it doesn't always come in like that. I would say in most of my key decisions, you know, different moves, different jobs, different opportunities, it has come in pretty loud and been been there. So, so, so you're saying that the, there's variability of its strength, yes, and its timing. And would it be fair to say that it comes at points when now, in retrospect, like you like to talk about, that it came at points when you really needed to hear it most? Yes. And do you feel like this sort of guidance you're receiving from this entity, right? Or possibly your higher self, I don't know what it is, is saying, um, hey, Jerry, why don't you do this? Or that's not something you should do. Is, does it, you know, when you look back at it, is it a clear cause and effect that this thing is telling you this is probably not the best option? Or is it saying how you should emotionally handle something? Like, I'm trying to understand the context I understand. of these messages as they come through. Yeah, we're talking about the male figure here. Yeah. You know, not yeah. Debbie. Not Debbie. Right. We well, haven't I even got into Debbie yet. Yeah. There's, there's the two figure, things huh? that are happening for you, right? and both of them need to be very clear. Right? There's, a, yeah. there's a lot of people that are experiencing this yeah. that, that need to understand this. So that's why we're... Well, now this is... Let me... Sometimes I can, I can link it together once I get down the... Down a little bit more down the road when I start making contact, the after death contact with Debbie that I want to okay, elaborate cool. on. I can I can link it together there because you'll see where it comes. Because the, 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 I mean, you don't know the story, but there's no, other people that appear. Yeah, and so this and this is what yeah, I find multiple. interesting. And what I want to know is if at the beginning of your life, you know, as a spirit evolving on its path using this you know meat sack that you have, if that you were already predisposed to this type of communication, telepathic communication. And that is something that I'm interested in because if you have the ability to hone and focus on it, which I'm guessing you have as the story begins to unfold, you as an instrument will show others that they can also focus in on that specific talent that they have, an innate talent that we all have. But for others might just be you know, coming through so that they can be like, oh, wait a minute, maybe I can begin to develop this more. And it's not... To say that, you know, it, it is like a second personality you have, you actually seem quite stable since I've met you, right? So it, in, in, from what I'm understanding my experience of being with you is that, you know, this is a, another voice that is coming through. And so what I want to know is everything about it. So that another person who is sharing these sort of traits and characteristics that you have yourself, because you're not an anomaly. There's plenty of other people oh, like yeah. you, but you're the one that's actually decided to come on here on the microphone and actually talk about it. Yeah. Well, they... Jason... Yeah. 
what do we got to do? Peg this thing up? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'll fix it here uh, here while we're doing it. But uh, one, one thing that I really want to uh, really focus on, and we've talked about this before, Jerry, and I want, if you don't mind answering this question, do you feel like it ever imposed on your free will? That's no. important. Never. See, so anything that imposes on your free will, and you know this, and because we've talked about this before, you know, um, one-on-one, it, it is, is uh, do you want to use the word wrong or... Um, no, it's not wrong. If it's something just, is speaking to you and it's it's telling you to do something bad that's or a, against your will. That's an obvious red flag because yes. nothing in creation will step on your free will. That's okay? right. You have every choice and to I'm do gonna, everything you want to do. I'm going to address this part of what, what when you asked that question because when there we go. I have these conversations with Debbie, there are things she will say and things she won't say, and she has never, never said something that is let's just say wrong to do okay she it's like a never, sherpa guiding you up the mountain but yeah, not imposing on you no 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 there's no imposition there's nothing going on like that cuz i that that would be a red flag and i'm aware enough to let's just say cut off that kind of communication but again as i go down the road here you're going to see alex some things that that come to the surface. You're going to see some, there's some or hear weird, some weird things going on yes. with free will and all that. Okay, so. good. No, well, bring me down that road, please. Okay. So, you know, I have this moment with, with Debbie and I had another moment too at this uh, labyrinth um, in Sedona up on, uh, I forgot the name of the road right now. Uh off this road, you know, the forest service would always knock those things down. But I went up there one day and I did a little meditation on this rock and I had a, not a real noticeable, but I had a feeling there was someone else with me at that time. It was very, you know, goosebumps and just different kind of a feeling that someone was there. And I'm not saying it was her because, you know, I, I never asked her that question and I wasn't in communication with her at that time because from like 1996, 1997, uh, there's a long, there's a long to 20 to 2012 before she actually made her full presence known. But let me walk you through a couple of things that are were very profound. Hold my hand. Take me there. I'm living in San Luis Obispo and I'm working as a manager at the San Luis Bay Inn as a sales manager at a timeshare resort. So I used to go to the, um, uh, there's a wonderful uh, spa restaurant there. Uh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but there's, so I used to go for massages and body work. So I connected very well with these three massage therapists. And so Deborah Caldwell was one of them. So on one Saturday afternoon, I call over there. And all the, you know, all the receptionists, they all knew me because I, sp- I spent a fair amount of money there. And so I call, I said, uh, can I get in this afternoon? I don't know who the girl was, I don't remember her name. I says, can I get in there this afternoon? She goes, Jerry, we have a tour bus that just came in and everybody's busy till this evening. You know, and I try to, you know, push my way around a little bit. I says, can't you redirect some? I says, I really need to get in. Jerry, honestly, you know, I'd get you in. But you, you just, you know, this evening, I've got some time with Deborah at, I can't remember, seven or eight o'clock. And I said, okay, if that's the best you can do, I'll take it. So I go in for that, for that massage. And so I also, you know, again, let me back up and I'll, I'll, I'll blend it in. I was having this, this connection with the footprints in the sand. You familiar with the, the footprints um, walking on the beach and it's you know the two sets of footprints. Turning. Yeah, there were there that was popular in the in the Christian yes in the I, Christian sector. I, I've literally you probably this, this was no uh, this was eighties yeah. and nineties. So yeah. th- there Explain was a um, yeah. and, and like my mom had a bookmark in her Bible of this. And so what it was was the footprints in the sand was you know, th- there was the story of that there was only one footprints in the sand, and then the whole idea was Jesus would look at you and say, you know, I'm carrying you. 
you know, so, and, and I'm making the footprints in the sand for you, you know, yes. type of a thing. Okay. I'm carrying um, you when you can't make it. Yeah. When you can't make it. Yeah. So that was like in the Billy Graham, 1980s, 1990s. That was a huge, and I know where you're in California, there was a lot of Calvary chapels with, uh, um, I forgot the guy that started all that, you know, the hippie guy with the surfers, but they were starting all these, you know, big mega churches started to happen and stuff like that. Okay. So Christianity was really hitting heavy in the early nineties yes. in, just, in, in well, California. The same time period, you know, around there. And so anyway, I get into the massage with Deborah. Deborah's a wonderful gal. And so uh, the massage is winding down. And so all of a sudden this, coldness comes over my whole body and like a wash when you say cold did the body become cold or did the actual surrounding atmosphere around you chill the body please you got to be clear yeah good that's great i would say the atmosphere around myself chilled and then i got cold okay good and so all of a sudden i have this emotional experience where I just start crying and crying and crying. And she goes, are you okay? You okay? And I said, yeah, yeah. She goes, well, I'm going to wait for you. I'll wait for you out in the reception here. Just take your time, Jerry. I, you know, I, I need to relax myself. And, you know, she goes, I'm going to bring you a glass of water and then I'll just go out there. So she brings me the water. And then this voice comes in and said, says to me, yes, I am the one who carries you when you can't make it. Man, I let go again. Okay, so, all right. So, this feet in the sand. Have you been, ha- like, these thoughts, was this a constant thought for you saying, like, you know, you're always thinking about the feet in the sand in well, a lot of different applications of things at this time? Because as you're projecting that thought out all the time, the consciousness is going to build that into the subconsciousness, and that's going to end up driving the will. So then you're just naturally exuding that energy of that thought pattern. So I'm curious if this then becomes a confirmation of this consistent thought pattern that we were having, was this a lot of the time you were thinking like this? Well, it preceded, you know, for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. You remember the Franklin Mint that used to put out the cars and all that stuff? Mm-hmm. Well, it was just coincidental. I was looking through a magazine and they had that metal. They had a metal shaped in a heart that had that whole inscription on there, a couple of feet, and I bought it. Now, and then and also sales manager timeshares. Yeah. Extremely stressful job. Yeah. Six, seven days a week, 12, 15 hour days. Yeah. That's why you were dependent on the massages. So, yeah. I mean, we, we have to take, you're probably at a eight stress level. It was up there. Yes. Eight to 10. Yeah. You know, I mean, cause you, you have to, you have to, you have people that you have to train and, and they have to make a decision now because when somebody leaves a timeshare, they're not going to purchase it ever, you know? Right. So you have to get, convince someone to purchase this. It's a high it's a high intensity, high intensity sales, high turnover. Yeah. High, high turnover too. Brutal. Probably. Yes. Yeah. This it's it's a very brutal. So I want people to understand your stress level as a sales manager was probably in it's that bad. environment. Cause I understand all that in that environment, you know, it's, do you feel like you're at an eight, a nine, a 10? Uh, yeah, let's you just th- say, let's just say eight or nine would be okay. Yeah. Real. So if we put together the whole uh, picture painting of you at that moment, you're on a massage table. You're physically relaxed to try and compensate for a physical and a mental stress that you have. And you're thinking about these thoughts of the feet in the sand. A cold draft comes over you, and cold is a good signature in physics of an energy density. Yes. Right? It's not going to actually be hot because it's actually it's pulling so much in. So <clears throat> this washes over you, and then you get a confirmatory word. So not only is the body relaxed, but now – there's almost a release that is happening. The muscles aren't released now. There's a trigger, an emotional and conscious trigger that is released when you hear this voice. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so I and, and I can yes. Um, I can attest to that feeling, not the voice, but I was in the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the Impressionist exhibit. I'm sorry, I was in uh, the New York, uh, New York Museum of Art or the Met, whatever it's called, one with the obelisk outside, and I walked in the Impressionist exhibit, and I was standing dead in the center. You know, I had been to all the other exhibits, like everything's fine, and uh, wasn't feeling it, albeit one bit emotional. And museums are hot. Yeah. You get everyone breathing in there, you know, and it's always, they always keep it at that warm, stable temperature that's moderately uncomfortable even in the winter. <laughs> like, wow, I, I want to wear my jacket, but I'm still sweating. I don't want to carry it around. And I'm standing there, and a large wash of cold comes over me. Mm. And I'm standing in the exhibit, and I start breaking down in tears. 
for no reason. Only in the impression exhibit. And I'm Al- Alex is not one to break down in tears. You're no. real stoic. Yeah, I, I would. It's not something I would do, especially in public, right? right? But it became an uncontrollable thing. And it's not like, you know, I was having like a huge hormonal imbalance. I'm like very stable. And then Amanda, my girlfriend at that time, now fiance, she comes over and she starts to feel this energy and she begins to cry and wow. she can feel that air. And I'm like, we actually need to leave because it was it, at the overwhelming nature of the energetic signature and what was going on in that room for me and that coldness was just almost too much that it was just like, I felt whatever was in there with me. It's not an emotion that I had. I wasn't harboring anything. Whatever it was, I, you know, connected with that energy that was in that room. And so when you're saying, you know, you had that release and that confirmation, you just began to sob, like that is something that I can absolutely align with. Well, there you go. And that's the way it happened. So, uh, you know, I'm there laying there and then all of this subsides. And so I start getting dressed and I'm just like, what was this all about? Right. And so everything's cool. I get dressed and, and I get out into the, the, the reception area and I, I, uh, I, she goes, Jerry, are you okay? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I says, cause she was still in the room and that, that cold, that cold came in. I says, you didn't feel that? She goes, I knew that something had shifted, but I wasn't sure what. And I said, okay. And so I told her a little, I gave her a little download on what, what I experienced in there. She goes, wow, that was, that's pretty amazing. And I said, well, yeah, it was. She goes, well, you know, here's another glass of water. You know, make sure you drink a lot of water, really relax. And, you know, just let me know if I can do anything for you. So I get in my car and um, Beach Boulevard is just a two lane street. You come out to the right. I lived in Arroyo Grande. And uh, so I'm driving up Beach Boulevard and I'm just, you know, like processing. And I, you know, I, I get 50, 100 feet and I just happen to look up and I look to my right as I'm going 10 miles an hour. And I look to my right. I said, What's that? It's standing on the side of the road. I says, No. I roll up next to it. It's a horned owl. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Say that into my, tell, tell us what I'm it sorry. was. I, I, I roll up, I'm going real slow, and then I look and I see the silhouette at the edge of this driveway, and I didn't know what it was exactly. I, th- I thought it could have been some kind of a statue, and I rolled up next to it, and it's about a two and a half foot, maybe, th- no, it wasn't three feet. It was two, two and a half foot great horned owl. Beautiful. Standing right in the driveway, like a like a soldier. Why was he on the ground? Well, I'm going to explain the rest to you right here. This is what happens. What's wrong with this bird? Yeah. So, I rolled up next to him, like perpendicular to him, like this. I'm looking out my you know the passenger window. Yeah. On the right side, and he's just standing there. I said, "Oh my God, maybe he's hurt." So I, he's in a driveway in the apron of the driveway. So I pull across the other side. I get out, and I'm expecting him to fly away any second. So I'm standing there, and I'm looking at him, and he's still standing, facing perpendicular to me. And so, you know, I'm standing there for a few seconds, and I start taking like very short baby steps towards him, and I start talking to him. I says, "Look at." I don't know if you're hurt, but I'm a friend. And I literally said words like this. I'm your friend. I would never hurt you if you're hurt. I'll take you somewhere and get you, you know, I'll get you taken care of and so on and so forth. And within a couple of seconds, I'm standing right next to him. I'm standing literally one less than a foot away. So I bend down. I put my hands up underneath and I'm. Get I'm out of here. Get. <laughs> on my mother's soul. I'm telling you exactly the way it happened. So I'm, I put my hands underneath his chest. I'm looking for feathers. I'm looking for blood. There's nothing. So I put, he's, he's pretty heavy for what he is. I pick him up and I got him here and he's right here. I mean, I got him way down here. So I don't know what's it. Gosh, that's a have. big bird. <laughs> he was mm. huge. He was huge. And so he's just sitting there in my, in my hands with me. Cupping between his feet like this underneath his... Just so everyone knows, Jerry was had his hand at about his waist and to give the measure of where the, 
this great horned owl's head was, was probably about Jerry's forehead. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Exactly. And you're holding this thing like a big, I guess you're holding it like a big bird, like you'd hold any <laughs> big bird. I don't really know. It's an interesting bird of prey to be holding. Yeah. And so I'm talking to him. I say, you are right. And so I, when I was, when I was kneeling down next to him, I went under his wings. I went under his belly. I went all around him and there was nothing. And again, like I had mentioned, I'd looked for you know blood or feathers in the road and, uh, um, there was nothing there. And I, and then I had him in my arms as I just mentioned. And so all of a sudden I'm talking to him and all of a sudden he turrets his head and those orange yellow eyes transfer some type of information. I'm li- I got the biggest goosebumps <laughs> on my body right now. I swear to you on my mother's soul that it's exactly what happened. And he transfers some type of information. And so what do you mean by transfer? I don't know. I felt something very deep and very profound that is beyond words. Was this in a, so it was an emotional transfer Yes, from the bird, from the bird. The second you made eye contact with his animal. Yes. Okay. Yes. And And you said, I just want to, you said this thing was about two and a half feet tall. He's yeah, he was huge. All right. You're, um, you may shit yourself. I am out last night doing my meditation and I knew that, we had this, this talk today and I didn't, I don't know anything about you. And I get a message from my girlfriend. I left the phone in the car cause I'd walked down and do the meditation on the Mesa. And she's like, you won't believe this. I'm like, believe what? She's like, the second I walked the dog down the stairs, this massive two and a half foot owl tall flies right at her. And it parks itself right on the top corner of our apartment. And when I say that, from where we are at the door at the top of the apartment, it's like seven feet. Mm -hmm. And it's sitting there staring at her. And she is so adamant. She has to call me. And she's like sending all these photos. And she sends me a picture. I don't know how long great horned owls live for. And I bet you they live for quite a long time. I think they do, yeah. I have a picture of it on my phone. Wow. Can I go grab real quick? And I want yeah. you to just tell me if this looks anything like the bird sure. you saw. Because if it does, I'm, I'm going to like lose my cool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is awesome. So you, uh, uh, so Alex is getting his phone. So you're holding it. Yeah. And then it, it, so it wasn't looking at you. It turned Initially, its head. It, it tor- tr- it yeah, because they can turn their head. Yeah. yeah. It turned at its head. It doesn't move its right. shoulders or wings. It just does this. And those, the eyes. Orange, you're right, yeah. Orangey yellow. And it was just, he just stared at me. And I was like, I, whoa. You know, I'm, 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 you know, like, wow. And I felt this transfer of feeling of something that I can't explain, but I will explain. Here's a bird. Oh, yeah, that's what he is. That. So first of all, I um, Amanda and I we watch just about every single bird of prey that's in the area. We have seen uh, golden eagles, we've seen bald wow. eagles, we've seen red tails, falcons, everything. Yes. And I've watched just about everything that flies in this area, from hummingbirds to you name it. Wow. Okay, and this is the first time I've ever seen an owl in this area. I've never seen an owl, and it is the first time that she has ever seen one in her entire life. And the fact that this thing energetically graced her, it flew right at her. Yeah. And then it carried itself right up and it sat on the perch and it just sat there with her. And she stood there and she kept looking at it. And you know, I'm like, and she's wondering, she's like, she's like talking to me. She's like, Alex, I don't know what the owl means. She's like, look up the symbolism. She's like, you know, owl could mean death or like a big change. Or I don't know what's going on. And she's like reading all this shit online. And I'm like, I, listen, Amanda, I have no clue, but I'm sure we'll find out. <laughs> and you come here on this podcast synchronistically and you start telling me that there's this huge two and a half foot bird that you've picked up in your hands. Yes. And this thing has a perfectly turreted head in this photo. And it happened last night. Yeah. And this is a big old great horned owl. I am just really, um, <laughs> I don't know how I would really uh, line that up to say that, you know, it's an impossibility. It was just, it's so improbable. I'm actually amazed. Well, it, you know, it ends up happening like that. And I spent a you know, fair amount of time there holding him. And I was kind of curious because he didn't give any visual signs of, uh, uh, pain. of pain. So I said, well, let's see 
if you can fly. So there's this, actually, I, I, a couple of years ago, I went up to San Luis Obispo and actually went back to that spot. I, I was there one other time and let me back into it this way. So I, I give him a little push and he takes off and his wingspan was like my arm. I have the video of this. The wingspan is probably, was probably that, that it's large. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And so he flies across just, you know, just a few feet away, uh, 10 feet away, 15 feet away, you know, what, eight, 10, yeah, 15 feet away or 15, 20 feet away. And he's up on this, this light pole. That's not really that high. It's just a short light pole. A big truck would hit it. It would knock it over. And he just stood at the end watching me. And I just, you know, I spoke to him and I thanked him and I drove home and I was living with this guy, Roger Volk, Roger, Roger, you're not going to believe what happened. And so he comes out, he goes, well, what, what happened? And he, so we sit down in the, in the living room and I tell him the whole story. He says, oh my God. So the next day he, he bought me this notebook with blank pages that had the horned owl on it. He bought that. He says here wow. to make some notes. And I had it for a while and I'm not a great, uh, I'm not a great uh, journaler. So anyway, the, the long and short of it is I can't remember exactly. I was still living in, in San Luis Obispo. But the next day I went to the, uh, to the Barnes and Noble bookstore and I started looking up everything. And so the, the explanation that I resonated most with was the resonation resonated about how the Hopis view the owl. A lot of, Oh, what is that natively? Yeah. To, what is that? Well, natively it was the death of, see, a, a lot of them say that the owl is a bad, you know, can be a bad omen. Well, the Hopis look at it a little differently, and I got to just dovetail something in in a second. But the Hopi, owl tail, <laughs> the owl tail. It I'm is. sorry, it was pathetically That's crazy. Great. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And so they said that it was the beginning, the death of an old part of you, and the beginning of a new part. Well, what ends up happening right after that? I can't remember exactly, but one evening I went back over that way, and I parked right there. And I'm just sitting there, and it was, I don't know, 9, 10 o'clock at night. It was a beautiful night. And all of a sudden, he comes out, and he flies right over me. They all flew right over. Well, not, well you know, up about. No, I understand what you're saying. He, I, he could have flown anywhere he wanted, and, and he chose to fly right above your head. Right above my head, about, I don't know, 20 feet above my head. Sure. I said, oh, my God. I almost, like, again, I almost fell over, right? And so I went home again, told Roger the whole story. He goes, well, I don't know. So uh, uh, I don't know what the exact time period, but let's just say it's within a couple of weeks, which it probably pretty easily was. I used to be a sales trainer, okay? Mm-hmm. And I worked up in Oregon for the Thomason Auto Group, which was a big auto group that had like 20 stores. And so I had turned down the job to be their trainer, and I went to move to, you know, to Sedona. And uh, this time I went, this time my, 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 my friend who was a, uh, a big proponent of our of me being the trainer at the company calls me up and says, Jerry Scott Thomason wants you to be the trainer. Anything you want, you know, he'll give you. He just wants you there. And says, so "You really sure, Mike?" And he says, "Yeah." He says, "I'll pay. We'll pay your move. I'll, we'll buy your car back from you. It was a Subaru Outback. And we'll give you a car and all this stuff." And so uh, I went up there, I built a, tra- well, I supervised the building of the training room, which has some re- really, very cool stuff in it. And uh, he put, and- this is really interesting. So side note really quick. You, um, what type of lighting did you put in there? Uh, 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 grow lights, basically. Are you talking about for plants, like full spectrum yeah, lights? Full spectrum lights, yeah. <laughs> he put that, yeah. I just going inside, people are just growing like weeds. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the fluorescent lights, as you know, they suck the energy out of you. They can drain the minerals out of your body. So when we had, when we constructed the, the, the room, I had them put the vital lights in there. That's what they were at the time called vital lights. I had them put non-off gassing carpeting in there and I had them use full spectrum paint on the walls. Great. Love yeah. that. And I also had an ozone machine in that room that we kept on very, very low. I mean, he's got one too. Yeah. 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 Jerry told me about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, you know, they put me in charge of the whole thing, give me like $12,000 a month, give me, I, can't, what was I, what did I, have? I don't remember the exact car I had. It was a brand new car. Um, I think it was a Forerunner. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, 
you know, all these good things happened, but there was a change. The, 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 the end of the story is there was a big change that happened. It was the death of me as a timeshare sales per, a manager, which paid great money, by the way. It was, you know, over 20 grand a month at the time. But I went up there for less money. But training is more fulfilling for me because I like helping people. I love helping people. I love being part of a, a process where someone evolves and I put a little piece in place or I put my hand down figuratively speaking to, to pull them up to the next rung of the ladder of their life. Sure. And so I, but, I was, bef up the, oh, before you even get into that, you, yeah. you, you, you just like jumped right past. What was the emotional transfer though from the bird? I don't know what it was. To, but, I, but how I did you it, feel though? What did it, I, you know, I know, you know how you felt. Well, it filled my body up with a, with an energy that was, again, see, I wasn't as conscious as I am now. Not that I'm some, you know, great uh, psychic or spiritual you know, master, but I just felt this overwhelming. It was positive. I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. it was okay. Just, so it was just like a, like a large positive sense of love that came yeah, from this. Yeah. That, that's a great way to say it. Oh, yes. Good. All right. So go ahead. Now that I have a context of this energy that you're imbued with and you're up in Oregon with your forerunner. What's happening next? Well, I'm doing all the sales training up there. And, and of course there's always people that resent you. There's always people that are trying to knock your legs out from money. So that was part of the big auto group thing or big corporate thing. And, and so Scott loved my, the work I was doing, hiring great people, you know, all positive feedback, but a couple of the GMs were threatened. They think I want their job. Mm. And this one guy, Red Mark, who used to play guitar for um, for Jefferson Airplane, he was a, he was the the GM of the Toyota store, and so he just called me in one day. You hire people that are too good, you know. He's beating me up, and I says, "Man, I don't need this. I'm just trying to hire people, you know." And I says, "I'm over there in the training center, just doing the job you guys hired me to do. You all endorsed me, so now I'm doing it. Now it's not good enough." So. There were a couple of other little run-ins where I was getting this uh, this pressure that I didn't like, and I ended up leaving there, going to with this other big auto dealer, Larry Van Tile, which was a set more. A lot of it was a sideways move because Larry was not gentle on people like myself, mm. and so you know I did that for a year with him. Which which the Van Tiles just got bought out by Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah. Oh, really? That's yeah. how big they are. Oh, yeah. wow! Three yeah. billion dollars. Larry got a lot of money. And uh, he's still involved in the car business. But anyway, there were a lot of changes. And then uh, moving to Sedona, then after I got done with all that nonsense, I moved back to Sedona, got back in the timeshare business. Well, first I went to Lake Havasu. Then, um, uh, Havasupai? Uh, not at Havasupai, but just Lake Havasu. Oh, okay, yeah. It's a timeshare resort there. And this guy, Tom Dunlap, says, Jerry, I know what you're capable of. You're going to be left alone to do your thing. And I was the top closer there for 11 of the 13 or 14 months that I was there. And if I wasn't first, I was second. I was doing great. You know, there was helping a lot of people, training, doing a lot of great closing, you know, great grosses. Everything was there. And so um, uh, I get a call from these guys in Sedona that I worked for for a little while in 95. And they said they wanted me to come there because they knew I was doing great. So I went to the Sedona Pines Resort. I was a sales manager there. And, um, I wrote more business than anybody than three sales managers combined in one month I had, and they were all jealous. And it was just one of these things where, I don't know, and I was just doing my thing, but that all settled down. I was at that resort for 11 years, but in between that, I opened up this, uh, wellness, this wellness center with this Dr. Hutton called, uh, it was the, um, the, um. Healing Center of Oak Creek. I have no idea. Don't ask I, me. I'm just no. I'm, rem I'm trying to remember <laughs> the, the Healing Center of Oak Creek. And my my part of the company on the inside was Square Wave Wellness, where I was doing a lot of electromagnetics, Tesla, Rife stuff. Why? Okay, you open this up. Great. Why did you open it up? Well, because I was always drawn to health and wellness. Because I had kind of reinvented myself a few times. You know, it's very specific for you to start talking about like Tesla coils and things of that nature. Yeah. You know, like T. Thompson Brown kind of stuff. Yeah. So, again, why the draw towards that? It was a familiarity that came as soon as I saw the equipment. Very interesting. Okay, now we're now we're getting into something juicy here. Yeah. Okay. Was, so a familiarity, a like the uh, like a familiarity you would have felt with Deb. 
yeah, it was very much like I had known the equipment before. And then coincidentally in Sedona, I meet this guy, Ralph and Ralph builds Tesla coils. And you saw the picture of the one machine. Mm -hmm. It was huge. You know, we had, I had, I had a couple of them. And so I tell. I think this is important. I don't mean to interrupt you, Jerry, but um, because we're, we're, we're getting into the point to where you're going to be able to um, people will be communicating with you. Right. I mean, we're coming up to that point. We're coming up to it right now. So, so Tesla, we all know this and, and Alex, you know, this too, as far as being able to be interdimensional. Yeah. People, you know, when you look at Tesla and you look at his work, that's what he was looking at. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of scientific things that he was doing, but he was very interested in interdimensional. Yeah, Tesla yes. Tesla was very concerned with mathematics of nature. Yes. And, you know, we all know his 369 thing, right? It's right. like the trinity of numbers. He said that was the key to the universe. Right. So in terms of that code, he took that application and put that mathematics into, into frankly, all of his design. And he took a lot of, you know, very natural laws and applied it to what he was making in the material. And I think that's where a lot of fantastic stuff happened. And then that led towards the, you know, the precursor of the Philadelphia experiment, getting things to actually phase out yes. of this uh, dimension uh, for a brief amount of time through, you know, high amounts of, you know, voltage going through stuff. And that's essentially what a Tesla coil is doing, right? right? You're, the voltage is extremely high. It won't kill you. You know, every, most people know it's that it's the amperes that actually kill you. Right. But when you have voltage that's very high, it allows the molecular structures, you know, the atoms actually phase in and out of state. And so, it's, it's strange that, you know, he was delving in a realm that was like on the, the bridge between the seen and the unseen. And now you have had these, these communications, right? These thoughts are coming to you and now you're dealing with advice and these devices that are essentially, again, a bridge to that unseen world. And a lot of these things, when I would be with people giving them a session, say they, they were scheduled for a, a, a Tesla coil session. I would be in the, in this room where I had the unit and a lot of, some of the people wouldn't notice it. Some people did, Mm -hmm. but there was a lot of stuff going on in that room interdimensionally. And it's again, it's a little hard to explain. It wasn't audible, but you could see things that were, cause there'd be this plasma field in the, in the room and you could see things going through the plasma field. You could see them. You could see some kind of a, I'm not saying it was orbs. I don't know what it was. Let's just uh, yeah, I want, I want to pause here just real quick. Yeah. We have time. So you bet we I, do. I just uh, <laughs> stopped my other podcast. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's some time. So I want to stop right there, Jerry, if we can. And um, so you have this testicle going and you're, you have a, a wellness center yes. in Sedona. Yes. And you are bringing people in and we had talked about this before. You're bringing people in that are extremely sick. Cancer. A yeah, of, we, a lot of cancer. people need to know what the context of the wellness center is and what the treatment they're looking for and what the expected outcome the is. Medical Clinic of Oak Creek had myself and Dr. Hutton, James Hutton, who was an NMD. Dr. Hutton uh, specialized in molec- uh, uh, um, which you can look him up online. I mean, he's well, he's not there right now. Yeah, I, right, right, right. No, but no, I mean, he 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 has background. work and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So um, this isn't just some quack guy. No, metabolic medicine. He did several things. One of them was ultraviolet light blood irradiation, where you take basically a pint of blood out, spin it through a centrifuge, you put it back in, and you ozone it when you put it back in, and it's it creates, it, it, well, it does a lot of things, but it scavenges, it kills viruses, bacteria. Well, that makes sense because you have the you have the third molecular oxygen in ozone, uh, ozone's yeah. O3. So yeah. that would allow any sort of free radical or anything that's in the blood to actually bind to that because it's a, it's a uh, organic material. So that right. would make sense doing something like that. And we had a 27 foot hyperbaric chamber. So we were really into anti-aging. Yeah. Hugely into anti-aging. So anyway, you know, that was all working along real well. It was very stressful. It made all the other jobs very stressful. Cause I'm dealing, I'm dealing with some movie stars. I'm dealing with football heroes. I'm uh, you know, dealing with music uh, people from the music industry. Uh, and these are all people that are coming to you, famous people that are coming to you that have cancer. Well, not all of them had cancer, but all of them, some of them had less. Was it, was it like trauma and really negative? Were, were, were these people like your were, last were resort for hope? Well, some of them were, they were they emotionally physically? sick. Yeah. So, yeah some, Is yes. that why you're saying it was stressful? Well, yeah. And that was a big part of what I did was also, I would, let's just say 
If I couldn't handle it, I sent him to this gal who's a great, great, she's got the kindest heart you'll ever meet and she knows what to do. So if I couldn't handle what was going on or I knew I needed another intervention to handle this person, uh, I would send him over to Veronica and, but either way I would talk them through or get them to talk about some of the subconscious things that appear subconscious, but what, their thoughts that go through their mind where they're not good enough, self-image, self-esteem, self-worth, go through all that. And you had the Tesla machine running at this time? No, I no, no. This was this is pre-Tesla machine. Okay. This is but it tied into it. And so I'd work with them on that energetic level to get them to understand that they have to let this this guilt and this worth, they have to build up self-worth, let the guilt, you know, they have to work on letting the guilt go. And there's a process to that that I, I go through with people. Okay. But make a long story short. Once their energetic body would start letting, you know, would start letting this this stuff go, there, it was easier to build up their alkalinity and balance their energy, and the the treatments were more were totally more effective. Okay, yeah. So essentially, after the mind preps itself through its consciousness, yes, in its own health, its own purging that is happening, it then can prime the body to say, okay. Now I'm ready to bring myself up to a state of balance that I need to be in. That's exactly it. And so if you go to my website, it's in the, it's in the web archive. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's in the web archive, Square Wave at Wellness. If you go to the web archive and you put that, um, uh, I can send you the link. Uh, there's some testimonials there, but I had about 300. And, uh, you know, there were, there were confidentiality agreements I signed with guys like Jimmy Caviezel, Matthew McConaughey, Helen Hunt, you know, bunches of them. Uh, John, uh, John Denver's wife, and so on. Take me home, country road. Yeah, and uh, uh, Cassandra, great lady, and so other, and many others too that I just I couldn't you know just say anything about. Right. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't anyway because those guys not only treated me extremely well, but they paid me extremely well because they said you, we know that if this story gets out it's worth a million dollars to you. So this is why we trust you. And it was, it was probably worth a million bucks that if I, some of the things I could have told reporters, you know, I probably could have gotten several million if I wanted to, but I never violated that confidentiality and I wouldn't do it today for anything just because that's the way it was. But I mentioned names and they weren't, uh, you know, let's just say it this way. Everything they had was recoverable. Okay. They could recover from, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. They just needed the right, the right, guidance. I just happen to be the right guy. At so one, once they're Jerry, so once you're doing these treatments, their body's becoming alkaline. Um, then you, you start getting into the test machines. Well, the, cause yeah. I want to get into this dimensional part and get into, yes. you know, Debbie and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm going to go, we're going to, we we're, we're right on the edge of that right now. And so, uh, anyway, let me just tell you one story. Um, I had this army captain Marine, uh, Laird, great guy. He had been everywhere. He's all sunken in. He's, he's all skeletal. Carries around this group of pictures under his arm. And uh, his PSA is 300.71. So his prostate's like this. Mm -hmm. He's got bone cancer. At His alkaline phosphate level is over 1,800. Guy's a mess. He was by the standards of the living dead. He was exactly correct. That's they, the only way I would describe that. He was living dead. They considered him dead. And the only thing that kept him alive, and, and that was with the oncologist that even said that for the army down there in uh, Tucson, where he was from was his will. And so I have a talk with him, him and his wife, Michelle, and we agree in nine days of doing what I do. And I also have this little formula of, uh, to create hydrogenated water. Got it. You just love the H3 kind of stuff, don't exactly. you? Exactly. It's the currency of water is the hydrogen. So when you release the hydrogen, a lot of interesting things happen. Well, after nine days, well, he came in walking on a walking stick. He had all kinds of problems moving. So I heated his body up several different times in a far infrared sauna mm -hmm. to create a, a, a fever to get his body to start kicking in the, the immune system. I treated him on the Tesla machine, treated him with right frequencies. And, and during the evenings, every 
I can't remember, it was every hour or two hours, he would drink 16 or 32 ounces of this hydrogen water. Okay. Well, nine days later, he comes in and he's walking pretty straight. He's looking actually pretty good. And so I said, Laird, did you make the appointment down with the VA down in Tucson? And he said, yes, I did. I'm going in. This was on a Saturday. He goes, I'm going in Tuesday. Well, he calls me Wednesday because they came in and reviewed the test results because he was kind of in that emergency case. They got his test results all turned around. So he calls later in the afternoon, and I happen to answer the, the office phone, and he says, Jerry, he goes, it's Laird. And I said, Laird, how, how, did you get your test results? He goes, let me read them to you. I said, you sound great. He goes, I'm so inspired. He goes, my PSA and Dr. I says, Dr. Hutton, sir, do you mind if I put you on the speaker? He goes, no, go ahead. He goes, I want Dr. Hutton to hear this. So I put him on the speaker. He goes, Jerry, my PSA went down from 301 down to 52. And so what's normal baseline? Uh, well, zero would be preferred. No, I know. I'm just trying to, so someone has a context of that change. Yeah. Like how dramatic that is. Oh, yeah. Is. It was zero would be preferred. But, you know, some people run in one or two, a little bit of inflammation down there. And so his alkaline phosphate level had dropped over 1,000 points in nine days. And so he, he said, let me read the letter to you that had the results. He says, dear Mr. XXX, uh, your holistic health program has worked wonders for you. Actually, we've never seen anything quite like this. Truly fantastic. Keep it up. We'll see you in three months. Mm. So... There were things like that that had happened. Now, on a side note, Jerry, because this is interesting, we, we like this. So you had some people from the government that were there, in, in, and you asked them something about aliens? Yeah, there were. These were high up. <laughs> Shame these are, on you these for are bringing something up. up. This is smut for me. <laughs> we're going to take, yeah, this is, <laughs> this the, is level, the real quick smut <laughs> this, before we get into the story. This is level 38 uh, Ultra, the, okay. the, the top, top, top secret clearance. Well, I don't want to mention so just the name. under cosmic. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. right there. Got it. And so, um, but they're right there. And so, uh, I we would bring him in, and he would come in. What branch of the military? You don't have uh, to say who it is. I'm just curious. Well, I know he was CIA, but I'm not sure. You know, it's funny. I, I don't remember if he was Army or or Air Force or what he. He might. He probably was above all that. Yeah, he just isn't the CIA. You know? Yeah. And yeah, because I don't remember that ever coming up. So, you know, we, we'd get him in the in the hyperbaric chamber. Then Doc Hutton would do his thing. I might give him a treatment here or there. So the bottom line was he'd tell you anything because he was so high. I love that. You should, oh, that's good. That's a great. <laughs> those are the people you want to be getting high. Yeah. And so he says, Jerry, I'll tell you anything because nobody will believe you. Yes, we've back engineered all kinds of stuff. We've what do got, you mean all kinds of stuff? <laughs> Can you be clear? All kinds of, yeah, all kinds of, you know, saucers and different uh, free energy devices and all this. And he goes, the reason I don't have a problem telling you is nobody's going to believe you anyway. That's great. Yeah. Nobody's <laughs> going to believe you anyway. So, you know, I said, Oh, that, you know, that's great. And he, there were other little things that he, you know, little sn snippets here and there that he told me in, you know, regards to, uh, um, uh, who was the guy that ran the black, the skunk works projects. Uh, At Lockheed. Yeah. His name I'm trying he died to, of prostate cancer himself. Yeah, uh, he should have came to see you. Why am I, why, uh, Ben Rich? Ben Rich. Oh, man, ben, how, look at that. Huh? Digging ben, it Rich, up. That's good. ben Rich, in his last interview, Ben Rich, in his last interview, on tape, says, we have the technology to take E.T. home. And this guy told me the same thing. Cool. Yeah, he told me the same thing. So that's That's, that's exciting. The, yeah. yeah, I thought that was stuff cool. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was very very cool. So you're so when when we're getting into these dimensions, when you get into you're doing all these treatments, you start bringing these testicles. Is that where things start getting? What start? When do you start receiving messages? Well, that happens shortly, but it did start to make me wonder about stuff in my dream state. And a couple times, I woke up at night in my bedroom. And there's this whole, remember I told you about this mist that came out of my crown chakra? Correct. Something very similar to that was in my bedroom. I don't know what it was. And I just, all did, of a did, sudden. Did it, was it, a, could you see figures or? Well, mist. It was it like okay, diaphanous I'm going to let looking. it all out of the bag. Yeah. I had two grays in my bedroom one evening. Okay. At the foot of my bed, but I couldn't. Benevolent, I couldn't, malevolent. How did you feel? Um, I felt Okay. But I couldn't move. 
I could I could barely move my head. And yeah, I could, that's funny. It's almost like you got the paralysis going on, right? Yeah. You know, that's not the first time I've heard that. Yeah, it was the paralysis. I couldn't move. I could move my head. I could roll my eyes, and there they were standing there, and then all of a sudden I was out. Mm. It was like maybe for, let's just say about, somewhere, about 10 seconds worth. But you're opening yourself up through this yes. clinic and everything else and, and, and doing all this. You're opening yourself up to this. Yes. So now I'm going to take you right to the, the point of where all this contact comes in with Debbie. So uh, a, a couple of years go by. There's nothing really notable going on about this, you know, this whole afterlife thing. Sure. And then um, I'm getting very frustrated with doing that work and frustrated with Sedona. And so I'm thinking about leaving. I don't know where I'm going to go. But I, I, I needed a front tire on my, not the red Ducati you saw in the picture, but I had this Multistrada. And so. Sweet bike. Yeah. And so I go, I go up to this motorcycle shop up in Flagstaff. And the guy, Curtis, was a good guy. He puts a brand new front tire on. There's a little bit of a story to that. But the, the bottom line, he puts a brand new front tire on. Mm-hmm. But he forgets to tighten. The pinch bolts that hold the axle up. Oh, my goodness. And he forgets to tighten the axle nut itself. So I get about eight miles from the shop. I go to pass a couple of cars. The speed limit in Arizona is 75, so I'm at least going 85, maybe 90. Sure. And the bike goes into a high-speed wobble. Uh, so it's all starts over, correct? And then you're just all over the place. And then I go over the handlebars. I wake up in the middle of the road. But in between all that, I had a, a, a Jesus Christ experience. I was in a kind of a gray kind of like in a gray tunnel. And uh, I don't remember seeing him, but I remember having a conversation. And the conversation basically led up to that, you know, we'd like you for you to finish. Okay. And so I end up back in my body. The ambulance is coming. There's a nurse there. I was gone for a little while. I hear her say, he's coming back. And I'm just laying there. I've got 18 broken bones. My leg's all torn up. I tried to stand up. I go, let me try to stand up. She goes, you can't stand up. Your leg is pointed in the wrong direction. Well, let me try anyway. (laughs) And what it sounded like, you know, glass shards when you break like a light bulb. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's what my, that's what my body sounded like. It sounded like a bunch of glass shards shards in in a paper bag. And so the ambulance comes, they get me in the ambulance. And we're not that far from Flagstaff. And so they got to cut my Ducati jacket off. Oh, a little sucks. bit sad. Yeah, I'm like $500 jacket. Because you want me to cut it off? What do you want to do? I said, no, just cut it. And so I get in the, in the ER, and they're all waiting for me. And the doctors start taking some vital signs, and they're, they're, I'm like half out. And they say, how is this possible? This guy's vital signs are normal. But he's just totally a wreck. Totally gone. And, totally. and you had... And this is like an NDE that you had here. So like, were you like on the way out and they said, you're coming back? No, though, well, like, I came back in the street. I'm sorry. I was in the ambulance and then they took me to Flagstaff Medical Did you Center. see someone that looked like Jesus or, or do you believe that? I mean, did you see like- a voice. Oh, it was a voice. It was a voice. Okay. Was a, a manly voice. A, a masculine voice. And it voice. was comforting. Yes. Do you think it was a voice that you've had all along? No. It was just a different one. Oh, so a little this different. separate from the one you've been hearing. Yeah. It was a lot different. And so, you know, they get me and they, they, you know, I'm half in and half out. MRIs, all this stuff. So I get up to the room. Uh, the nurses all knew who I was from Sedona, the ones that were on the, the second floor. And so this, I meet this nurse, Erica Roundtree. Erica used to have a... It's better than a, a square tree. Yeah. <laughs> she used to have a well, uh, not a wellness center, but she had a herb store down in Silver City. So we had a lot in common. So I'm supposed to be in the hospital 30 days. I snuck one of my Rife machines in, giving myself treatments all day long, all night, and a bag of enzymes, proteolytic enzymes. That's awesome. Yeah. And I <laughs> went for it. And so I get out in nine days. I get out in nine days. <laughs> instead of a 30 day. Instead of 30 days. And the other part that happened, which was real cool, the ne- that, that later that day, I think, it, I don't remember, maybe it was the next morning. I think it was the next morning. This guy comes up from the kitchen. He says, I'm so-and-so. I'm here to put together a menu for you. And I said, look, I don't want to cause any trouble, man. I, you know, let's just put down anything. I, she goes, he goes, why? And I said, because I typically eat organic. He looks at me and he says, you know what? I got a great idea. Let me get 
the manager of the kitchen to come up, the food prep, food, I forgot the exact name. Let me have her come up and, you know, let's just see what we can do. And I said, no, no, I don't want to cause any trouble. Hi, they got me on morphine. They got me on Percocets. They got me on everything. And so she comes up, this very elegant, stately, gorgeous lady comes in and she sits down with a pad on the bed across from me that was empty at that time. And she says, well, tell me about what, so I start laying it all out. She goes, we'll go buy this all for you. Oh, wow. So they bought me all organic food. Oh, she could cook for me all day. Yeah. <laughs> so they did all that stir fries and just stuff that was just, you know, fantastic. And uh, so I'm going to get, uh, Dr. Dan comes in. He's going to discharge me. He goes, Jerry, actually, I could have got out in seven days. He goes, I says, Doc, I said, I need a day or two to get my house situation lined up so I can get some people to help me. No problem. He goes, I'll give you two more days, uh, but I'm going to need the bed on Saturday. So Erica comes in a few hours later and says to me, I just looked at your chart, and she's an RN. I just looked at your chart, and you're going to get discharged Saturday. I go, yeah, and I got my phone in my hand because I'm trying to talk to people about you know helping me out a little bit. And everybody's working or doing something else. And it would have all worked out, but, you know, she goes, how about if I take you home, take you down to your house, and, you know, we'll just work it out inside your house. And I said, yeah, no problem. So she takes me home, wheelchairs me in the house. She wheelchairs me, and everything felt very weird in my place just because I hadn't been there in so long. And she goes, uh, she walks through my place and says, uh, i got a better idea. Let me take you to my house, and I'll take care of you. So she took me back to her house in Flagstaff and took took care of me for two weeks. Only things that happen in the medical system of the yeah, Southwest United yeah, States. Yeah. yeah. She took care of me for two weeks and she was a single mom. She had her son tail and um, she took care of me for two weeks and then she would have nursing students come in. I, my left butt cheek was all filed down from, it was all tore up. It was a brush burn third, almost third degree burn. From just, you know, going on the pavement. Sure, friction, yeah. Friction burn. And so she would have the nurses come in and change my... That dressing. The dressing, because it was weeping all the time. And then and then the nurses would say to me, do you need, do you want anything special? And I was feeling better. And so I said, would you go to uh, Macy's Coffee Shop and grab me one of their vegan muffins and... um I forgot the kind of coffee I liked. It was made with, I can't remember, rice milk or some kind of a latte, rice mm-hmm. milk latte. So, yeah, yeah, sure. So they'd go and they'd pick up all this stuff and they'd come, you know, every day. Do you want us to go to, and I didn't ask them to go every day, but about every other day I asked them to go, you know, and and they were really great. And so she ends up taking me home after two weeks and I'm in the cast and, you know, I'm busted up. I'm still sore. And so uh, then a couple of my friends come and help me out. And so everything bridged as I thought it normally would. And now I'm healing. And now this is when it gets really good. My leg is in a cast. I had busted the plates in my, uh, in my, uh, in, in my uh, uh, tibia here. And um, Dr. Glover says, look, at the alignment is still okay. I don't want to perform another surgery on you. And uh, he's talking about you like you're a Subaru. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And so um, he, uh, he says, so I'm going to put you in a, in, a, in a fixed cast and let's just see what happens. So he puts me in a fixed cast for about six months. It all healed up really well. And at that time, my son, who was living in Charlotte, North Carolina, says, Dad, I want you to come and live with us. And so I end up moving to Charlotte. But, oh, here's the parts that opens me up to, the, to all the after-death contact. There, you can go online. You can look this man up. His name is Gary Gelka, J- G-A-L-K-A. So how I found out about him, I was scrolling down one of my alternative websites, and the web, the, one of the articles was, Father Talks to Deceased Daughter. Okay. So I opened that link up, and there's this guy, Gary Gelka, whose daughter Melissa dies in a single car accident. She hit a tree. And he had a premonition about the whole thing. And uh, he made after-death contact with her. And they had him on, they had him on Ghost Hunters and all, uh, 
with Zach Bagans and all those guys or whatever that his show was. Is he the guy that created actually that uh, that little device? Yes, that's Gary Gelka. Oh, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the um, the Mel Meter. The Mel Meter. <laughs> That's his daughter. Oh, that's Maybe. too funny. All yeah. right, cool. Yeah, a millimeter, and a, he's got a couple of other uh, SB sevens, SB eleven, yeah, which are these uh, EVP devices. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Electronic voice phenomenon. So, if no one's seen and so Ghost I, Adventures, right? And so I listened, listened to what he said, and then this the voice comes in. This other voice comes in to me and says, "You can do this." I just that's all was said. So I end up moving. I end up bookmarking that. I end up moving to Charlotte. And so about once a month, June, July, August, September, I end up uh, playing that. And I maybe played it a couple times a month because it was so fascinating. And the voice would come in every time and say, you can do this. So in J- in September, about mid-September, I pull out my sharper image uh, amplifying headphones and this small digital recorder. And so I I make a broadcast, I'll call it a broadcast. Mm -hmm. I turn it on and I say, Debbie for Joni, are you there? If you're there, do you know who this is? And I'd be pausing. If you know who this is, say my name and say it nice and loud. Deb, I'm looking at a couple of pictures that we, we took some at that time, 41 years ago. There's a picture of you and a picture of me. If you can hear me, tell me where you are and tell me how you are. So I play it back, and it was the second time I tried it. It wasn't the first time. It was the second time I tried it. Debbie Frigioni, are you there? I'm here. Do you know who this is? It's you, Jerry. Say my name and say it nice and loud. It's Jerry. And so I get to the part where I say, um, about the pictures and it was a little garbly, but I believe she said, Oh, really? So at the rest of that tape, there were other voices in there. You had to listen, but there were other people, other things recorded in that, in that, that initial recording. And one of them is I'm sitting here waiting for you. And so I started to OD a little bit on this after death context. I stuff. bet you did. Yeah. I can see how you can actually deep dive into it at that point. Yeah. And so as that was going on, there was some, I got to think about this. So I asked her questions. Was there any pain? I felt nothing. Uh, why did you have to go? Well, this related back to karma with this girl, Anne who Debbie said had followed us through several incarnations. And the only way that the, the chain of that incarnation connection, because it was like the moth and the flame with her and I was that if Debbie gave up her life and that's how the accident was, I says, I never should have took you on that ride. And she said, Jerry, it wouldn't have mattered if it wasn't Friday, which August 6th was in, in 1971, it would have been Saturday. If it wasn't Saturday, it would have been Sunday. It was inevitable. And what would be the, I, I guess you would say, an alleviating purpose for you and Anne by Debbie leaving this material existence? Well, what ends up happening is that as I'm home, healing back in Buffalo. Now, remember I'm back in Buffalo. Now, Anne finds out the whole story about me and Debbie, that Debbie was really my real girlfriend. Hmm. And so she just, she was pretty hot and cold. She just canceled me right out of her life, which I, which was preferred actually, which was really preferred because the one thing I didn't tell you, and it's significant in the part of, of the night when, when Debbie said she could go on the ride, when Debbie went up in the house to talk to her mother, the, I said to myself, you don't, here's the exact words I said. I'll never forget it. You don't need that. Anne. this is the woman that loves you. And then of course we went for that fateful ride, 
But going back forward and all this, there's a one part that's going to, it's interesting that you brought up about what happens to the soul. Spirit. The spirit after it transitions over. Mm -hmm. She told me, I said, well, what happened? She, well, she goes, I, I had to rest for a couple of days. It's exactly yeah. what she told me. Integration of learning, right? Yep. It, yeah. Integration. And then when I, when everything was, um, when I was, you know, uh, capable or able, they, they, I never asked who they was, who they were. They brought me all these records about our history together. Oh, cool. So that opened the door. There was a lot of going back and forth. Other spirits came in. I did have, I did have some not pleasant experiences with, with spirits that were, let's just call them negative. Maybe it was me being negative or me having harboring some negative energy. You know, I'll, I'll be, a, you know, I'll own that too. Like but, attracts like Jerry. Yes. So I, that's why I said, and so there was these things and I had some of the stuff was pretty nasty, but then Debbie said to me, Jerry, let's get off the recorder. It'll be easier if we make a telepathic. I says, how are you going to do that? She goes, you have to permit me to make some adjustments back here in your brain. Mm -hmm. And they did that. And I felt it. What is it when you say felt? I felt there was something going on. In other words, somebody was moving something around. Do you think, cause you said they did that. Do you think it was plural? Like multiple people? Well, or? I don't know. I, that's what, well, yeah. you use the word they Jerry. And that's, yeah. that's very, I mean, you could have said just him, her, it, yeah. but you said they, they, and when they, you say they were retuning the back of your head, yes, I've read some literature that in terms of telepathy, there's two different forms of telepathy. Telepathy. There's you know just regular telepathy between you and I, which moves at a rate you know very quickly uh, beyond that of the speed of light. And then there's something on the terms of spirit telepathy. But in terms of regular telepathy, they it is said that it is more efficient in the manner if you concentrate on the back of the nape of the neck. And I don't I know if that's, not. I don't know if that's the area you're talking about. Well, yeah, it's, it was back here somewhere. You know, there was, you could feel it. Okay. So the back of the nape and when yeah. you feel, so you say turning, what was the feeling like an energetic, like adjustment? Wait, what is it like? Explain that. I could tell there was somebody in there moving something around. I don't know how else to explain it. That's the way it felt. I, I felt a little off kilter for a couple of days. Mm. Not bad, but I felt a little like bit off. Like dizzy or? Yeah, a, a little, you know, a little woozy, we'll call it. Your balance? Or yeah. But then it all integrated in a few days and she came through as clear as a bell, and I would talk to her every day. Clear as a bell. What does that mean? Clear as a bell is that the voice would come in on the right side here. It would it would be phone qual phone call quality. Okay. But not quite as loud, but phone qu phone call clearness. That's amazing. And it happens today, and it went on for a long, long time. It's gone on. But this wasn't until two thousand and uh, twelve. Twelve. So yeah. this was forty something years. It was. From 1971 right. to 2012, that's 41 years. Right. There's and no sense of time in the spirit right. realm, right? So and that's and I asked her, what took time. you so long to get in contact? What took you so long? She goes, you weren't ready. Yeah, and I guess you needed to go through other experiences to yes. actually get you to that point. And so I'm still kind of, there are these lapses now in some of our communication. She came through yesterday. It was a long talk yesterday. And she says, you know, because I got really sick. I hear it wasn't COVID, it was a bacterial infection, but it, it acted, oh, it was awful. But anyway, that's not what I want to focus on here. I just had to go through these things and it was, it was, it was, it was bad. I mean, it was the mandibular gland under here swelled up. My whole face was distorted. Everything hurt in my head. My chest was loaded up with all kinds of fluid and it, but it was bacterial because it affected my skin. Sure. And so they put me on some amoxicillin. It knocked it down, but I was doing other things too. But you, you had had a, um, you had had another motorcycle accident, or was it that motorcycle accident that punctured your lung? Well, that's the that second one punctured my yeah. lung too. And let me something. So you I, could get a bacterial infection from that, maybe or. Well, 
that was in 2012. And they, don't get me wrong, these bacteria can reside and hide for who knows how long, but I don't think it was related to that because I had, you know, my, my, my health was, you know, I came back, my health was good. But the one thing that I didn't mention after the motorcycle accident was I went through a lot of survivor guilt. Okay. I went through a lot of survivor guilt. And I still get little episodes of that. Oh, she, like she's dead and you're alive. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, she said, don't, you got to understand. And she, she will say things like to me, Jerry, on the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm, what I'm telling you is true. She will use those exact words. And so that, you know, I had, this is the only way we broke this, we broke this, this karma is that I had to come here and you were aware of it. We just made this agreement, uh, you know, that believe me, you'll, you'll see this when you get here, you will get a chance to look at all these records and the parts that pertain specifically to you and what you had to experience. What what I think is interesting too, and what you talk about, um, is where she says she lives. Yeah. Oh, so I asked her, this is great. Thank you for reminding Cause this is so, this is so awesome. You know, they can read your mind. So you got to be careful. Yeah. They can read your conscious yeah, thoughts. They can read conscious thoughts a hundred percent. Cause I had that happen with, there was a group actually of five women that really liked me. And one of them was this gal, Donna Fiducia, who originally lived in Indianapolis, Indiana. She died of emphysema because she still had the same voice, the emphysema type voice, yeah. you know, she had that voice. She goes, yeah, Jerry. And I asked her, I says, can I contact somebody back home for you? Can I do anything to, you know, help you at all? She was very sweet. And she says, no, she goes, but I want to tell you that uh, I'm in my beautiful 25 year old body right now. Mm. So she told me that. And these other women told me the same thing. One died in a car accident, one died of cancer. I can't remember what the other ones died. They were all sweet ladies, all really, really nice. So what I said to him was I said, uh, how, you know, and I already knew this kind of answer, but I says, how's the water there? What kind of, how's the water? Are there lakes and rivers and stuff? She goes, oh yeah, the water's crystal clear and all this stuff. I says, well, can we get a boat? Can we go sailing there? She goes, oh yeah, we can do all that. I says, well, when I get there, I promise you, I will take you all sailing. That's God's, you know, it's all true. And so I had the, you promise? I says, absolutely. You just, you know, let's just stay in touch kind of loosely here and just, you know, let me know if that still appeals to you when I get there. Oh, wow, wow, you're such a nice guy and all this, all these things. So they would interrupt things a little bit, but they were, they were okay. But those were the, the pleasant ones that I had talked to. And yet I had a couple of other ones that would use four letter expletives. Sure. Uh, and, you know, say different things to me. And so going back, uh, back forward again, uh, you know, the hard part here, guys, is just so you know, into the audience that's listening, the only hard part is, is it's, it's the not seeing her as an apparition. So you're, really want us to see her how you last remembered her. Yes. And she says she looks exactly that way, but she, here's what she told me when I asked her that she said she didn't have permission. Mm. So maybe in her level or however it works, you know, cause people have seen uh, Constantine Rautava. They've, they've seen uh, uh, Tesla has come through uh, to this lady down in uh, Brazil. Um, you know, many people have, you know, they've, they've come through. And so it always leaves, I hate to say this, it leaves a, a little half percent doubt that who I'm really talking to. But it does, from what I remember of her voice, and well, and, and again, oh, let me tell you some other things that make it very reassuring, is that uh, I ask her questions like, and I have, well, here's the thing about where she lives. So I, because I don't know, so I, you know, I don't have anything in my head. I said, so where do you live? And she goes, uh, I live where you used to live with Sherry and Roger. Well, she, Sherry was Roger's girlfriend. Mm. I said, you're in San Luis Obispo? She goes, yes. She goes, I've got a house right on the beach. I said, really? She goes, yes. 
And so I've had two dreams where I was inside the house and I had another dream where I was walking on the beach with her, but I don't remember the details. Like there's a part of it that's cut out. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, that, those are some of the things that have happened. And I, I'm sure if we sat here for another few minutes, there's other, there's other, uh, uh, experience I've had, but I've had hundreds of them, hundreds of them. So then let's do this because we do have to close this out. Yeah. With all these experiences that you have, yes, this has allowed you a chance to integrate some sort of learning through this experience, which yes. would accrue to some state of wisdom that you would have. Okay. With that understanding, that experience, what is it that you could share with our listeners and other individuals that are having these same sort of experiences, what would you tell them from a retrospective attitude, looking back at everything that's happened, what would you tell them that you should focus on right now? Because you know where the end game goes, where you are in your current state. So what is that for them? Well, it it really seemed that when I got into my heart space and knowing she was my soulmate, because she told me that, we had been through several incarnations together that uh, she said she had never been with anybody else that it was all about, <laughs> I'm going to use this word love, but it, the word love has some kind of meaning in my opinion that cannot be explained by words. It, there's no words to explain it. It's a, uh, it's some kind of an integration of some higher energy that comes through you or resides in you. And if you just happen to blend that love with a, I don't know, it could be a parent. It could be, it could be a, 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 a girlfriend, a wife or wh- whatever, whoever that um, that's what I think bridged all this and, and made it happen because believe me, there are no words to describe 50 years of on and off torment because I've been married a few times. It was never good enough. Nothing was ever good enough. And it was always, as I woke up a little bit more, I started to realize that some of this guilt still hanging around, even though I've heard that it had to be this way. It's a hard living in this 3d world. It's, and you, they, you get pounded by all these guilt statements. You're not good enough for this. You're not good enough for that. And so on and so forth that it just, it, it's taken a deep root in my, both my conscious and my subconscious because it's, it's awful at times. It, It was, I'm doing a lot better but it was, it's been pretty awful at times, man, you know, and uh, especially when it doesn't matter if it's 40 years, 40 days, 40 hours, 40 minutes, 40 seconds, somebody dies under your watch that close. Well, first of all, anybody dies, but somebody that close, what do you say to that? How do you articulate that in a feeling or words? It's, it, it changed. It had a ripple effect. It changed her family. It changed her friends. It changed, it just changed a lot of things, the way people looked at me. And that all, you know, that subsided after a while. And I would have to state, you've missed one thing. It also changed how you looked at yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, uh, My, you know, at, at 70 years old now, my focus, my focus, I'm going to just lay it out, is I read and look at a fair amount of information about understanding the afterlife in the different, let's just say around 11 different levels or dimensions that exist. And this third level, and I just can't remember the name of it right now, is where most good spirits end up. This is where most people end up. Second level gets a little bit closer to the density of earth. And the first level is very much earth-like where you have the same stresses and 
a lot of the same experiences that you had while you were in your body. You concur with this? Yeah, I mean, this I, it doesn't sound like there's something out of base at all. Yeah. yeah. So, but the third level, um, I, for, I forget the name of the. I'm, I apologize. It's, I'm a little emotional right now, but it's it it's it's this beautiful place where most of these like these other women that I had spoken to, and I've spoken to my mother several times, who has come through. And the funny part, I just got to tell you this story. My mother comes through. I said, Ma, how are you doing? And she's got a Polish accent. Oh, I'm doing good, Jetty. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Oh, Ma, I miss you. I love you and all these. Oh, yes, yes. I said, Ma, I know you're around when I'm sewing. She gave me this sewing kit in this little, this little box. Yeah. And she goes, oh, yes, I help you all the time. I help you all the time sew, and you need a lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, and my mother was an excellent she could darn socks she could crochet she could make you know doilies and all these things so i know it was her yeah yeah i knew it was her because just her saying that and then one of the other times she came through we had this little talk and i said wow what did you used to drive well she referred to her bicycle instead of the car she had she goes well i drove my bicycle and she, I had this triplex house, and she lived in the lower rear apartment. And so when I when I got rid of the house and stuff, she you know I, I created a life estate for her, and the guy was good with it. And so anyway, she goes, "Well, I drove my bicycle, and they stole it, which they did. They mm. stole her bicycle out of the doorway. She had it halfway right. in the doorway. And so you know, there when somebody says th- things like that." There's no doubt. How can anybody else know that, right? No, yeah. This, yeah, no, you're right about that. And then even for yourself, that confirms enough of it with whatever you're supposed to learn from that conversation. Yeah. And so if we consider the a metaphor of your mother talking to you about improving your sewing, yeah, you know, that needle, that thread, that's that love when you integrate it and begin to weave it in all these different shapes and patterns, that's the thing that really holds us all together. Wow. So I think, you know, that, Again, it takes practice having that perspective of love and that understanding. And then from that can really open up doorways to things that a lot of us did not think was possible. But through your own life and your experience, you're a testament to that possibility. I feel blessed being able to share this. You know, I, I, uh, I wish, you know, uh, there were thousands of people. I was in a, you know, like an auditorium with thousands of people so they could see who I am. You are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'd be surprised the auditorium yeah. you're in right now. Yeah. And just really, you know, what I'm saying is just really have them, f- you know, feel me about how profound this has be, been. It's been, it's, it's been amazing. Like, you know, Debbie will be there. She'll come in. She was gone for a little while, not like just a few, you know, maybe, maybe two weeks. And, um, yesterday she came through and we had a nice little chat and, uh, you see, you know, here's let, let me explain something about what, what baggage I carry a little bit. Well, you know, I, f- 50 years ago, I'm going out with this Ann, right? And so 50 years later, and again, I had guilt when I was doing that. So 50 years later, I still have that guilt. So I said to her over there, I, I says, uh, you sure you're not attracted to anybody over there? Are you sure there's no relationship that you'd rather pursue? I asked her those questions, you know, and she says, Jerry, you're my soulmate. And I've gone through this with you many times about all of what happened. She goes, no, there's never been anybody. There never will be anybody. So it's this thing. I'm living in this loop. Some, excuse me, sometimes that's just, I think, um, I, I mean, not to interrupt you, but Alex, I think we're here for this reason for this time. Yeah. Um, you love to teach and you say yeah. that you have to get to the point um, and I want you to talk about this. I don't have to. You're <laughs> Jerry. You have learned that process, taught you to the point to now. It's time for you in the next, whether you live for five years, ten years, twenty years, whatever it may be. It's time for you to teach. Well, I, I've and this is this right here is a perfect example. There are people that are. 60, 65, 55 years old that are experiencing the same thing and think they're going crazy. There are people listening to this right now. There's a widow that's listening to this and she's sitting in her bed and she keeps hearing her husband and she's crying. And you 
have the opportunity right now to be able to teach. But well, you need to get to the point to where you feel like you're worthy enough. Yeah, and, well, the only, there's, and I'm going to have to cut you off. We're going to double team you here. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You need to integrate for what sounds like one of the greatest learning experiences of your life, and that is understanding what guilt is and how it actually, no material thing could ever hold that guilt against you in your existence. That's mm. something that you hold in your own consciousness, and you've buried it very deep. And the only way for you to actually deal with it and learn from it is to thank it for what it is. The experience of everything that's happened in your life, even Deb passing, and integrate that. And if you can do that properly, now you're talking about true love. And that would probably be the final boat of healing that you would need to go through. And then once you're there and you've gone through that experience, that's something you can, again, continue to teach to other people. And she, I guarantee you, the amount of people that you'll be able to teach from one life, mm. you know, especially we all believe in reincarnation. We don't believe. It's just a meat we suit. Know it. It's just a meat suit. Right. Yeah. She was in a meat suit. But her to give up her meat suit for you to be able to teach and comfort others, that's true love. I'm telling you, man, this, that, that lady was so far advanced not that she said profound things, but just the way she conducted her life. But but, but Jerry, did. you're making yourself lower mm -hmm. than she is. That's precisely correct. Like you you do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Because of the guilt. Jerry, there but is But you yeah, will not be no. powerful in your teaching, because we learn, teach, teach, learn, you know that. Yeah. Until this guilt is dealt with. And that has been the lesson. And I who knows? I may have committed suicide or something if I had that much guilt. You know sure. what I mean? We all, we don't know. You I know what I mean? Know. Alex, you're super young. You know, I'm 47. You're in your 20s. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, and that's so horrific. I've never gone through anything like that, you know? So I'm, I'm not, we're not judging you in the least bit. I'm no. just saying you have an opportunity. You have such a beautiful story. That's why we had you on. You have such a beautiful story and you're going to help a ton of people with this because this has been captivating. I mean, like literally... From the minute you started talking to the owl, then I'm once hooked. the owl hit, yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm okay, well, this, I mean, did you see what happened with the owl? This is a confirmation to you to say from the, from here on out, you're going to meet people in your life. They're going to come into your life. I guarantee you, where you're going to have the opportunity to teach, but you're going to miss it because you're so focused on the guilt. That's precisely correct. Well spoken. Well, I appreciate this. And I want to. You know, I've been working on it a long time, a lot better than I used to be. Because you're uh, good enough, you're extremely intelligent, and you've worked this story out in your life to the point to where you're ready to teach. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you need to embrace that. that. And holding on to that guilt is something very illogical that you would be doing. And doing that will only hinder your evolution. And if you said that you're in the business of grabbing people and pulling them up to the next stage, mm, yes. you need to learn to do that to yourself. Jerry, listen, thank you very much for this story, this experience, and actually, you know, being able to sit here and share, you know, all of these, these feelings with you. And I think, um, the honesty, I mean, yeah, the honesty like, is, you know, it's big and I learned just, you know, a lot from what you've taught me. And I hope that, uh, yeah, I'm going to listen to this again. I learned a ton. I, yeah. I, I'm going to learn more just listening to it. And that's going to be reciprocated by all parties that hear this. So uh, thank you a, very much. It's and, an honor to, to be with you. It's an honor to address the audience. It's a, an honor to just hear what you've said, what, you know, some of the steps I need to take. and um, That we all need to take. <laughs> yeah, it's not just you. It's everybody. Yeah. And, uh, but I, you know, from my heart, it's, uh, it's, and I didn't complete this statement, but I, I kind of got into it. And I'll, if I did, I'll just repeat it again. See, that's what I've, I, I've been preparing now for the last few years for this, this last jump into the, the light speed thing, you know, going mm -hmm. into the, that next level. I don't think you're done, though. I don't think it's afterlife now. I mean, I think you're ready to teach. Okay. Well, I, think, I, I think, you know, maybe it's two years. Maybe it's five years. Maybe it's 10 years. But to just want to go just hang out with her in another dimension, you know, when there are so many people in this world that you have the opportunity right now to share a story and to heal and to pull up off the ladder, like you said, yeah. 
you have an opportunity. Do you know how many people there are? You could go to a nursing room and now and start walking around. And I guarantee you within 30 minutes, you would have five people that would be so captivated by your story. And they would literally thinking, I have Alzheimer's. I'm going crazy. I'm hearing this voice in my head. There are so many people that are drugged out on prescription drugs right now because of the same thing. You're smart enough, intelligent enough where you recognize that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. And there are a ton of people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that need to hear your story, that need you. You heard that voice in your second motorcycle accident and says, you're not done yet. You're not done yet. You're not done yet. So keep that in mind, Jerry. And remember one thing, all is one. Yeah, well, thank you. That was great. Thank, thank you, Jerry. You Look within, look within, look within, and live your life on the edge of two worlds. A reality where you find true understanding of who you are. The learning is done. Become the teacher in embodying the oneness of all. Walk the cliff's edge between the seen and the unseen realities. Become a higher density being. Please go to www.higherdensityliving.com.com.